Father God, we this morning uh, we want to acknowledge and confess that you are a holy and perfect God. That in you there is no corner of darkness. That you live in unapproachable light. There is no God like you, holy, righteous, and perfect. And so this morning as we come before you in your word, we pray that you would help us to be a people who would submit, surrender our lives to your perfect holy word, and be a people who would learn to know what it looks like to live in the presence of a holy God. We pray that you'd help us to appreciate Jesus, our high priest and mediator, all the more. And we ask this in his strong name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, there is one central question that emerges out of these uh, few chapters here that we're going to be looking at this morning. And, And can I just encourage you, read your way through 1 and 2 Samuel over the next couple of weeks, because we simply do not have time to cover all of what is happening in these, uh, in these stories here. But the central question that emerges out of chapter 6, but it's really this entire narrative, chapter 4, 5, 6, and a little bit of chapter 7, it's called the Ark Narrative, and it really centers around the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to spend our time looking at that. But the central question that emerges out of these verses here is a question that pops up in 1 Samuel ch- chapter 6, verse 19. And the people of God say this, Who can stand... In the presence of a holy God. Who can stand in the presence of a holy God? That's a good question. And we will see that's a really pertinent question for God's people as we dive into this narrative here. But the presence of God, in fact, actually poses a threat to God's people. If you remember um, the, the story of God bringing his people out of slavery from Egypt through the wilderness. They set up a a little tabernacle, a little portable tent. And in the middle of the tent, they put this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. It's where God's presence was said to dwell. And they would follow the Ark as the the glory of the Lord shone through the day by a cloud and and a pillar of fire at night. And they would set up the tabernacle and camp around it until God's presence moved forward. And then they would pack everything up and follow the Lord through the wilderness. And God's presence was said to dwell amidst his people. And in order for that to be a safe thing, the entire sacrificial system was set up. And really, if you want to understand the grand arc of the entire Bible, we have to solve the problem that occurs there in Genesis chapter 3. And that the problem is, as a result of humanity's rejection of God, people are kicked out of the garden out of the presence of God, out of the place where humans dwelt with God in his presence, saw God face to face and had access to the tree of life where they could live forever. And humanity is kicked out of God. And really the entire Bible is how do we fix that problem? How do we get back into God's presence without God completely destroying us because of his perfect holiness? And the Ark of the Covenant is the very center of that. Story. Now, when I say the ark, I'm not talking about Noah's ark, right? There is another ark in the Bible. It's not Noah's ark, the giant ship. We're talking about a small wooden box that was covered in gold and had two cherubim on top of the ark. And they were angelic like composite creatures, half angel, half human, half animal. Or really, that's a third, isn't it? Third angel, third, third human, third animal. And they had these giant wings that, that cut, they were covered in gold that sat on top of the box. And it was said that that is the seat where God would sit and he would rule and reign on earth from this very presence. Inside the ark were a number of elements, Moses' staff, uh, some manna, a bunch of other things that were stored inside a drawer in the ark there. And the ark looked a little bit something like this. I think we have a picture of it here on the screen. That's what it looked like. So we have a, a, a giant box and then along the side of this box were these Uh, rings which poles were inserted through because the ark needed to be carried. Now the ark needed to be carried because that's what monarchs in the ancient Near East did when they traveled. They were seated on a throne and hoisted up and carried along poles. And so here is God's throne with poles on it that he needed to be transported. They would pick it up on these poles and carry God on his throne around as they traveled through the wilderness. This is symbolic of 
the representation of God's presence on earth amidst his people. If you're familiar with the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, anyone remember that movie? Anyone old enough to remember that movie? There's a few of you. It's worth watching, but that's, that's the thing that they were looking for in the movie, right? They're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And to this day, it's lost. We don't know where it is. So if you want to join you know, the search, go, go looking for it. But we don't know where it is. We don't know where it ended up. Chances are during the Babylonian exile, it was destroyed or taken away and has been lost to this day. But at this point in the story, God's people still have the Ark of the Covenant. And in the, the present moment, it is present in the tabernacle at a place called Shiloh. Now, we remember from last week, that's where Elkanah and Hannah traveled to, to worship God, because the temple was set up there, the priesthood was there, the tabernacle was there, and in the middle of it was the Ark of the Covenant. So they went up to worship, and the Ark of the Covenant is there. Now, Israel is living quite close to their... There are three nations that form the holy trinity of Israel's enemies throughout their time, right? That is the Egyptians, the Babylonians... And the Philistines, right? The Philistines live on the coastal fringe, just between the mountainous range. There is Israel, and here are the Philistines on the coast. And they were Israel's arch enemies. And they go to battle with the Philistines here in chapter 4. And Israel is defeated. They lose 4,000 soldiers. It's a staggering loss. They're defeated. And they come back and they ask the question, why did God bring this defeat upon us? And it says this in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. When the soldiers returned to camp, obviously they told them the news, we lost, 4,000 soldiers died. The elders asked, of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. And so Eli the priest sends his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They take the ark of the covenant down to the location of the battle here. They go into battle. They fight. Uh, Well, before they fight, actually, as the Ark of the Covenant turns up into the Israelite camp, Israel shouts with such a loud shout that it says the ground shook. And the resulting Philistines, they were shook as well because they had learnt that a God had come into the camp. And their conclusion was, well, actually, we've heard this story before. The Philistines had heard of what God did amongst the Egyptians. This is well known amongst the ancient Near East. They knew what God had did amongst the Egyptians, that God had destroyed Pharaoh and his armies in the Red Sea. And so they conclude, we're in big trouble, right? A God has come into their camp. We're in trouble. Now, their conclusion isn't, hey, we should, we should stop what we're doing and bow to this God. No, their conclusion is, we ought to be men of courage and fight. And so it steals their courage. They fight And the defeat of the second battle is worse than the first. 30,000 soldiers die this time. Along with them, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two sons, are killed. And the Ark of the Covenant is captured. Now, why does this take place? Well, we know that Samuel, as, as a young man, was given a prophecy from the Lord about judgment that was going to come on Eli's house. And it says this in chapter 3, verse 11. The Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. That's pretty full on, right? What, was, what, what did Eli's sons do that was so terrible that would cause the Lord to judge them in this way? Well, Eli's sons were acting as priests in the tabernacle, as mediators between God and his people. And as the people would bring their sacrifices to the temple, the, 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 the priests were offered an allotment of the sacrifice, a portion of the meat, right? It was to be given to the priests. It was to be boiled and then given to the priests for their food. That's what they ate. At 
Phineas and Hophni instead went to the people who were bringing their sacrifices to the temple and demanded that they give them like the best part of the meat, the meat that was still covered in the fat. And the fat portion was said to be burnt off as the offering to God. And they said, hey, can you just let the fat portion be burnt off and then you can have the meat? And they said, if you don't do it, we'll, we'll take it by force. And so they were literally, they were stealing the offerings that the people were bringing to the temple. And you add to that, it says there that they were sleeping with the women in the temple. So they're sleeping with the women who are serving in the temple and they're stealing people's offerings. Now, there is thousands of years between Hophni and Phineas and the church in the 21st century. But I tell you what, not much has sadly changed. When, when leaders and pastors steal the offering and sleep with women, something has gone categorically wrong in the church of God. And here we see the judgment of the Lord coming against the house of Eli. Eli's problem is he didn't do anything about it. He just let his sons continue to do what they were doing. The result is that the Ark of the Covenant is captured Hophni and Phinehas are dead. And at the end of that little passage that Bree read for us, we see this little story about Phinehas' wife who's pregnant and she goes into labor and she delivers a son and she calls the name of this son Ichabud. Last week I was, people made fun of my pronunciations of the Israelite name. So I got this one right. Ichabud is how you pronounce his name. Or Ikkabod, if you're an Aussie. Ikkabod. And his name means no glory. His name means no glory. Because the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. This is a prophetic, I mean, it's just real, 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 quite obvious what's happened here. She has said, in this moment, God has left the building. God has left the building. The glory of the Lord has departed from his people. Could there be a scarier picture for the people of God? amongst the nations who are out to get them, that God has left and the glory of the Lord has departed. Now Israel's problem here is that they had treated the Ark of the Covenant, the very seat, the throne of God, like a lucky charm. And they thought that if they could just wheel out the Ark of the Covenant into battle, they would win their battles no matter what. And it's really not that much different from superstition. Right from a rabbit's foot, a lucky's charm, that is how they have treated God. And I wonder how perhaps we might fall into the same temptations of religious syncretistic superstition. Perhaps we might hang a cross on the wall of our house and believe that the presence of a, an icon on the wall protects our house even though we live completely contrary to the way that Jesus called us to live. Or, you know, maybe we put a fish sticker on the... I don't... Does anyone, does anyone even put fish stickers on their cars anymore? But you, know, you put a fish sticker on the back of your car and you think, I'm protected, I'll never have a car accident. Yet you drive like you're on the dodgems. It's like, and then you're angry when you have a car accident, right? God, well, I, had a, I had a sticker on the back window. My guess is we don't do that. That's too obvious, right? We're, we're sophisticated, urbanite, Sydney-siders, right? We would never do that. We just, perhaps we do this in more subtle ways. Like we pray and expect that God would just baptize our plants. Or we seek to manipulate God with our prayers and our church attendance and our serving and our giving. And we expect that because we've done that, God owes us and then he will be our lucky charm who's going to bless our life and make it great. This lesson here that we see from 1 Samuel chapter 4 is that we cannot take the presence of God lightly. He is a holy, perfect, and righteous God. So the Philistines, they capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take it off to their temple, the temple of Dagon, and they put Yahweh in the temple as a bit of a trophy, a sign of their victory, a sign of subservience to their God, Dagon, and this profound encounter happens. Really, the battle is not between Israel and F F the, the Philistines. The battle here is between Yahweh, the Lord of the universe, and Dagon, the God of the Philistines. And something profound happens here in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. Have a look at what it says. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took him, they took it rather, and put 
uh, sorry, from Ebenezer to Ashdod, they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord in a posture of worship, right? They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. It's, it's actually quite humorous. There's a lot of irony and sarcasm here thrown into the narrative from the narrator of this story. But here are signs of Dagon's impotence. His head has fallen off. He's incapable of thinking. He is not omniscient. He does not know anything. He cannot speak. His arms are broken off. He's impotent. He cannot act. There's no point in praying to this God. And there's something quite humorous and ironic about them picking, <laughs> picking their God up with their hands and then placing him back on the altar. And then he falls down the next night and his arms and hands have fallen off. Here is a sign of their God who is dumb, deaf, blind, mute, incapable of doing anything in contrast with Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, the God of his people who is powerful and Dagon falls down and worships him. And the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord in the midst of the Philistines is a curse in much the same way that it was amongst Israel's army, here God is present and it is a curse amongst the people of the Philistines. Yahweh, it says, the narrative tells us, inflicts tumors on the Philistines, much like the plagues that broke out amongst the, Hebrew, uh, the Egyptians back in Exodus. He inflicts them with these, this curse of a plague that manifests in tumors. And so the Philistines, just they keep moving the ark from city to city to try and move the problem along. It goes from Ashdod to another city to another city. Eventually, the third city, they say, enough. Do, do not bring the ark of the covenant here because we don't want, is, want what has happened in your cities to happen in our city. They conclude here that the hand of the Lord is heavy against them. They use that phrase four times in chapter 5. The hand of the Lord is heavy against the Philistines. Now that word there, the word heavy, is actually the same word. It's actually the root word for where we get the word glory. And so I think we have the words up on the screen here, the Hebrew words. The Hebrew word for glory is kabud, kavud. And the Hebrew word for heavy is kaved. Right? That is the root word for glory. And so literally they are saying the glory of the Lord or the heaviness and weightiness of the Lord and his hand is against us. Here is this story where Israel has said the glory of the Lord has departed. He's left. He's gone. And yet we have this encounter in Dagon's temple where the Philistines recognize, in fact, the glory of the Lord is right here. The presence of the Lord is right here, and it is frightfully dangerous to have this God in our midst. We use this, um, this kind of play on words in English as well. When we say something is light or lighthearted, or when we say something, that was a heavy thing to say, we, we use a very similar play on words here that the narrator is using here to help us capture something about the presence and the glory of God. And he is trying to demonstrate that even though it appears that God has been defeated, that Israel has been defeated, that the glory has departed, that God remains present and glorious and his presence is not to be taken lightly. The weightiness of the Lord is against the Philistines. And so they devise a plan, the Philistines devise a plan after moving the Ark of the Covenant from city to city to city, that in the end they're going to send the Ark back because it is a liability. And so the priests of the Philistines devise a plan. They, according to their best knowledge, they decide that they're going to offer a sacrifice to Yahweh to appease his wrath and the, the judgment that has come upon them. And so they form, they fashion five gold tumors and five gold rats, we don't really know why the rats are there, but perhaps it's connected to the plague that has come upon them. And 
Some scholars speculate that perhaps this is the bubonic plague that has broken out amongst the Philistines. And so these five gold rats, five gold tumors, they put them on a cart with the Ark of the Covenant and they connect the Ark to two carving cows. That is, these cows have young calves who they are still suckling and they, they devise this plan. They say, we're going to test God to see if this is really his hand against us. We're going to lock the calves up and, and attach the cart to these calves and we're, we're going to send these cows towards Israel's territory and if they don't turn to the right or the left, if they're not drawn back naturally like mothers are to their bleating calves, we know that this was what God had done to us. If they just head straight for Israel's territory, we know. So literally the priests follow the cart and just as they suspect, the cows turn neither to the right to, or to the left and head all the way into Israelites, the Israelite territory. They end up in the field of Jacob and the people there on the border town of Beth Shemesh, which you can visit today. It is still there. It is still visible. There are still ancient ruins there at Beth Shemesh. And they've received the Ark of the Covenant back. It says this in verse 19. But God struck down. Sorry, they they received the Ark back. They kill the the cow. They make an altar. They take the, the timber from the cart. And they set up the ark on a giant rock there. And then some of the people peek into the ark of the covenant. And it says this in verse 19. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked inside the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy, there's our word again, the heavy blow of the Lord had dealt against them. The people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? This holy God. To whom will the Ark of the Covenant go up from here? And you read this now, you think, really? I mean, just just for looking in the box, 70 of them died? Is this just like a gross overreaction from God? 70, like we can understand the Philistines, right? We can understand Hophni and Phinehas, but, but the people of Beth Shemeth look into the box and 70 of them die. Well, the book of Numbers in the law, God gave instructions about the Ark of the Covenant. And he said this as part of the instructions of picking up the Ark of the Covenant and moving it to a different location. It was a very specific routine that they needed to go through. They would take all of the elements of the temple and wrap them in thick leathered skin animals, right? Signifying that death had to cover these elements. And they would cover the Ark of the Covenant. They would pick it up on their poles and they would carry it to a place. In fact, in Numbers chapter 4, verse 20, it says, But the Korathites must not go in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, or they will die. Here is the fierce, uncompromising holiness of Yahweh. That he is so perfect, so holy, that sin and the pollution of his people cannot come into his presence without him doing something about it. His presence ought not to be taken lightly. lightly. Here are people who have failed to see, perceive, and honor God as holy. They had forgotten the law. They'd acted as if they were priests, destroying the, the cart, sacrificing the animals. None of the, the men of Beth Shemesh were consecrated as priests. They had not worshipped God as he had told his people to worship them. I think we, we read these passages and think, well, this is an overreaction on God's part because we have failed to see the uncompromising holiness and perfection of our God. He is entirely other. He is perfect. He is infinite. He is holy and righteous. He is transcendent. He is the God in whom there is no corner of darkness. He lives in unapproachable light. He is flawless, uncorruptible. That's the God that we worship. And his presence ought not to be taken lightly. That's the whole point 
of the entire sacrificial system. It's the whole point of the way that the covenant and the, te- uh, the, the tabernacle and the temple was set up. If you were to look at a bird's eye view of the temple, you will see that there are multiple checkpoints along the way to prevent the people of God getting close to the Ark of the Covenant again. Sacrifices needed to be made. Blood needed to be shed. In fact, the priests would walk in with a smoke screen to protect them from gazing upon the glory of the Lord in the ark. In fact, only once a year was one person, the high priest, allowed to enter the presence of God. Because God is holy, perfect, righteous. It's a reminder to us, is it not, that God is uncompromisingly holy. And I think we can forget that. We who live this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we're so accustomed to the concept of grace. We're so comfortable with new covenant worship of just turning up to church and casually sitting and singing a few songs and then going. We're so familiar with that. We're so familiar with our access to the presence of God that we pray without any blood needing to be spilt, that we are acquainted with talking to God like He hears. We're so familiar with that that we forget where we have come from and what the cost was to purchase that for us. And I wonder if we need to recapture some of the reverence of worshipping God. Not to minimize the access, not to minimize the blessings of being a new covenant believer, not to minimize what Jesus has done for us. Not even to minimize the fact that Jesus calls us friends. But we must never forget that we worship a holy, perfect, and righteous God. And we do not worship God on our own terms. We come to Him on His terms. I wonder what the ways are that we treat God like a lucky charm in our lives. We ask Him to just baptize our plans. He's a rabbit's foot that we might keep in our pocket, the lucky four-leaf clover that we wave over our life, hoping that he would just simply dispense blessings, like a child at a party who just whacks a piñata, hoping that lollies will come out. I want you to suppose that I want to take my wife out on a nice romantic date. And so I say to her, we're going out for dinner. Get dressed up. It's a surprise. And I take her out to a seafood restaurant Three Hat, Michelin Star, you name it. Really beautiful seafood restaurant. We order a dozen oysters as a starter. And I get her a glass of Chardonnay. And I sit opposite her and I say to her, Honey, your rich, curly black hair and your deep blue eyes, they just do something to me. I love you so much. I've organized a camping trip with the kids next weekend. Now, you're laughing because those of you who know my wife, like she, she doesn't like seafood, she does not drink Chardonnay, and camping is the last thing that she would want to do. That's not honoring to her. It's not loving to her. If I take her out on a date that does all of the things that she hates, what does that say? It's, it's, I'm a terrible husband at that point. After 15 years of marriage, I ought to know better. And yet, so often we will treat God like that. We will treat God the way we think that He wants to be treated. You know, we live in a world where we're so accustomed to wanting to greet people and welcome people in terms of their personal preference of how they want to be greeted and welcomed. And yet we pay so little attention to how God wants to be treated, how God wants to be welcomed, how God wants to be received. We don't get to tell God how He thinks. We don't get to tell God how He operates in the world. We don't get to tell God who He is. We worship Him on His terms, not ours. You know, when that gets flipped, when we tell God, when we want to control God, that's called idolatry. It's doing exactly what the Philistines did, shaping and fashioning a God in the image of our imaginations. And our God is a holy God who will not be treated like that. But when the people of God do treat him in the way that he deserves, something profound happens. And we get a little glimmer of hope here at 
the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 7, it says this in verse 2. The Ark of the Covenant is returned. Yes, the people of Beth Shemesh have suffered a defeat and a loss, but the Ark is taken up and it's placed in another city and God is treated right. It says this in chapter 7, verse 2. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. And so Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and their Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. And if that, all of this whole thing could have been avoided if they just did this back in chapter 3. Or if Phineas, Hophni and Eli worshipped God as he deserved, all of this could have been spared them. But here in chapter 7, they treat God as he ought to be treated. They, they see the holiness of God and they worship him appropriately. And he takes care of them. And it's a reminder to us that revival always begins with a fresh awareness of the holiness of God. The people of God worshipping God as He ought to be worshipped. That leads to repentance of sin and cleaning our lives out of the things that act as idols and false gods and functional saviours. It's a beautiful picture of what it looks like for the people of God to worship God on His terms. The question that they ask, who can stand in the presence of a holy God? Who can stand? And many years later, another king who would come after the king who was coming, King Saul, King David was his name. He penned a psalm, a song. In Psalm 24, it says this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who might go up to Mount Zion and worship God? Who may stand in his holy place? Who can do this? Well, it's the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart can stand before a perfect, holy, righteous God. And there is only one who has clean hands and a pure heart. The Son of God, the great King Jesus, who came and walked this earth in flawless perfection. A life of obedience before His Father never Never once did he sin. Never once did he worship God in a way that God did not deserve or desire. And it's against the backdrop of the fierce, uncompromising holiness of God that we begin to appreciate the work of Jesus and what he has done. In John chapter 1, as John is opening up his story of the life of Jesus, he says in in 1.14, he says, that the Word came and tabernacled amongst us, made His dwelling amongst us. The Word there is the same Word that's used of the tent that was set up, the presence of God amongst His people. John says, here is Jesus who has tabernacled the presence of God amongst His people and He has revealed what? The Father's glory. Here is one, Jesus, the righteous one. And he he came not only as the temple, the tabernacle, the very presence of God, the one who said to the, the, the Israelites, you destroy this physical temple and I will rebuild it in three days, speaking of his death, resurrection. Jesus also came as the priest. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says that when Jesus came as priest, He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made by human hands, that is a part of the created order. He went through the tabernacle that was the heavenly tabernacle, that the earthly one simply was a representation of. And he walked into the presence. And we know that that beautiful story there as Jesus hung on the cross, breathing his last, the curtain in the temple that divided the holy of holies from the rest of the temple is torn from top to bottom, bursting open access to the presence of God. Jesus is the one 
who can stand before a holy, perfect and righteous God with clean hands and a pure heart. And then he becomes, not, not only is he the temple, not only he's the priest, he also becomes the sacrifice. He becomes the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And he does that by offering his body on the cross, the once for all sacrifice for sin, never to be repeated again, sufficient that we may have access to God. And that, are, that is a staggering reality. And I tell you what, if, if you were to jump in a time machine and transport yourself back to the ancient Near East and have a conversation with a Levite or a Hebrew and say, God, you will never know what it's like to be this side of the Messiah. I go to church and God is present and we sing and we pray and there's no need for blood because it's been off the, there is this once for all sacrifice that has been offered and is done, never to be repeated again. It is sufficient. And right now, the spirit of the living God dwells in me. My body becomes a temple. It's a staggering reality of the promise of the presence of God amongst his people. But I'm telling you something. What we experience now, it's just the starter. It's, there's more to come. Because as Jesus returns in his glory as king to reign and rule this universe, we will stand before him and see him face to face. The problem of Genesis 3 is solved. And we will be back in the garden in fellowship, worshiping. It's a beautiful picture of what it means to be in the presence of a holy God and it has been purchased and done.